We need every Catholic to experience that, and the truth is not every Catholic does. Uniting us around the source and summit of our faith, a special episode of EWTN News In-Depth dedicated to the Eucharist after the launch of the National Eucharistic Revival. We're connecting this, these deepest truths, the mystery of our salvation, to the greatest gift that God has given us, which is his continued presence. Leaders of the historic event share their hopes for the future of Catholicism in America. Keep coming to confession, keep letting go of your sins so that we can place ourselves in a disposition that is um, okay with receiving Christ. Receiving the body of Christ holy in the minds of the faithful. The prayers and actions Catholics should take to be in a state of grace and participate. And proof of our faith, how miracles of the Eucharist continue to bring us closer to God. EWTN News In-Depth starts now. This is my body, which will be given up for you. The source and summit of our faith, the Eucharist, is not truly understood or believed in by many Catholics. Welcome to a special episode of EWTN News In Depth. We dedicate this episode to exploring the deep meaning of the essential sacrament of Holy Communion as the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops launches a three-year nationwide Eucharistic revival. We will dive into the alarming study about the lack of belief in the real presence in the Eucharist, get a better understanding of Holy Communion as it's relayed in the Bible, and the steps Catholic bishops are taking through this Eucharistic revival to spark deeper faith and a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ within the Church. Reporter Mark Irons begins our coverage. These parishioners at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Parish in Woodbridge, Virginia, believe receiving the Eucharist is essential. It's the most important thing in my life, and it starts the day off right with, with Christ and receiving his body and blood. There's no better way. For me, the, Jesus is my daily bread. In the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus preaches, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Father Brian Bashista, pastor at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, explains it was a hard teaching for many to accept. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. This was horrifying to the Jews. And many who followed him were like, this is too hard. We're out of here. But the apostles stayed. And the Catholic Church teaches Jesus remains alive and fully present in this holy bread. It keeps me going. I believe it's one of the uh, processes that helped me to stay with my faith. But according to a 2019 Pew Research Center survey, 43% of Catholics believe the bread and wine is symbolic and don't know the church teaches the Eucharist is the actual body and blood of Christ. A 2020 EWTN News Real Clear Opinion research poll showed similar figures about half and half. Father Bashista told us it takes faith to believe in Christ's resurrection, and Catholics need a similar trust in what happens at Mass. Why can't we believe the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon that bread and wine to transform that into Jesus' glorified body, blood, soul, and divinity? St. Mother Teresa once said, Jesus has made himself the bread of life to give us life. Night and day he is there. If you really want to grow in love, come back to the Eucharist. Come back to that adoration. Questions and uncertainty about God's divine presence in the Eucharist can be brought up in prayer. So if someone already has made up their mind that's not Jesus, God's not going to violate their free will. But it's an open, humble, inquisitive heart. It's okay to ask God questions but to do with an acquisitive heart, not a doubtful heart. Father Bashista says if someone has the gift of faith, they should pass it on and invite others to Mass. Lay Catholics we spoke with say it's also about teaching the next generation. I think it's really educating our young people in the spirituality and the belief of the Eucharist being the body and blood of Jesus. Ted Zagrobelny, a parishioner at Elizabeth Ann Seton, believes everyone is on an individual faith journey. His has brought him to the Eucharist. Just thinking about it, you know, Jesus loved us. 
But then he said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be with you forever. And he is. And he's there in the true presence, in the body and blood, soul and divinity in the Eucharist. And it just kind of brings you know, a little chill to my spine. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. The Feast of Corpus Christi, or the Body of Christ, began after a Eucharistic miracle in Orvieto, Italy, when a consecrated host started bleeding. It was taken to Pope Urban IV, and he instituted the Feast of Corpus Christi for the Universal Church in 1264. At the Vatican, cardinals and priests held a Eucharistic procession for Corpus Christi after Mass. They walked through St. Peter's Basilica and outside, carrying a monstrance that held the consecrated host. Cardinal Mauro Bembetti, who presided over the Mass, reflected on the Gospel, saying that Jesus takes us by the hand to accompany us as we discover the way to eternal life. This year's Feast of Corpus Christi was the launching point for the National Eucharistic Revival. EWTN News In-Depth's Roselle Rages gives us a look at the three-year plan to awaken Catholics. We have a strong desire that over these three years of the Eucharistic Revival, people all over the church will be engaged, will make a choice to re-examine their relationship with Jesus. Three years to help American Catholics realize the unshakable foundation of our faith. Perhaps to begin for a first time a personal relationship with him to allow Jesus to convert us, to heal us, to transform us so that we can be better positioned to be his disciples. The U.S. Bishop's strategic plan works from the top down to fulfill their mission to renew the church by enkindling a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. The first year focuses on diocesan staff, bishops and priests to have each diocese offer events that encourage the faithful to foster deeper devotion and knowledge about the Eucharist. Sister Alicia Torres, who serves as an executive team member of National Eucharistic Revival, says a team of preachers comprised of more than 50 priests will travel nationwide to support these efforts. With the help of Catholic partners like Our Sunday Visitor, a Catholic publisher, there will also be online formation and resources that will raise up Eucharistic missionaries at all levels of the church. We pledged $1 million towards, uh, towards the revival that helped kickstart these, uh, these efforts. Um, but we also um, are producing materials for the, uh, for the Eucharistic Revival. Some of those are available already. One of them called My Daily Visitor Eucharist, which has 40 wonderful meditative uh, reflections on the Eucharist. The second phase focuses on the parish level to strengthen liturgical life through adoration, missions, resources, preaching, and more. 2023 Corpus Christi will begin the year of parish revival, where everything that started to happen on the larger diocesan level is brought down into the parish level. We're currently preparing resources so that there can be Eucharistic small groups in parishes. The third year of the movement kicks off with the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, where thousands of the faithful are expected to take part. It will be the first Eucharistic Congress in the U.S. in nearly 50 years. The last one in 1976 drew more than one and a half million people to Philadelphia, including 400 bishops from around the world. From the Congress in 2024 through Pentecost of 2025, the goal of the revival is to have the entire American church sent on a mission to share the gift of our Eucharistic Lord with their local communities and beyond, dubbing it the National Year of Mission. This is the most special way that Jesus is present to us. There are other ways, but the Eucharist is the most special. It's his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Rosal Regis, EWTN News in Depth. Bishop Andrew Cousins from the Diocese of Crookston, Minnesota, is leading the Eucharistic Revival. He's the chair of the USCCB's Evangelization and Catechesis Committee. I spoke with him about the impact he hopes the revival will have. Thank you so much for joining us, Bishop Cousins. This revival is the culmination of efforts by the U.S. bishops to understand how American Catholics see and understand the Eucharist. The summit in Indiana absolutely is exciting, but how will this affect parishes around the country? Thank you, Monse, so much for these questions, because this revival is really an important moment for the Holy Spirit to work in the United States Catholic Church. And you know, the revival is a three-year revival, and so we really hope that in the second year, which is really focused on the parishes, we're going to reach down to the smallest level of the church, the family, small groups, 
And we really want to engage those people who they have some connection to the church. Maybe they even come to Mass somewhat regularly, but they don't fully understand the gift of the Eucharist. And this is one of the key goals of the revival. You know, we're all kind of shocked by that 70% number of Catholics who say they don't understand or don't fully believe in our in the church's teaching on the Eucharist, that Christ is really and truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And so the way to reach them is going to be through the parishes. And so we hope that second year that having equipped and inspired missionaries in the first year of the revival, they'll be the ones to reach out in the parishes and invite people to small groups, invite people to Eucharistic adoration, invite them to participate more deeply in the Mass and to learn about the Eucharist. Because we know that if those people uh, come to discover the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, it changes everything. It helps them be more authentic disciples, and it's going to actually commit them much more deeply to the church. So it's really our goal to reach the parishes in the second year of the revival. Absolutely, and that's right. It changes everything. Let's talk about that number you mentioned. The Pew Research Center had a poll that went out polling people American Catholics' belief in the real presence. Seventy percent don't know what it is. Where would you recommend someone start if they doubt or they just don't know? Where is a good place to begin to discover this wonderful gift? Well, I would recommend two things to people who doubt or don't know. First, actually go to adoration. Why would I say that? Because, you know, this isn't just a problem of the head. It's also a problem of the heart. And the Holy Spirit works through Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And so when people are able to put themselves before him in prayer that and have that silent time and begin to try to converse with the Lord, the Lord reveals himself. And it's the Holy Spirit that actually converts the heart, right? But then, of course, on our uh, website, eucharisticrevival.org, there are many other excellent websites, too, that have tons of educational material. But we're going to really be providing kind of basic level courses for free on our website that anyone can go to and can begin to discover the gift of this Eucharist. So study this question, because what you're going to see is that this teaching comes right from Jesus in the New Testament, John chapter 6. He couldn't be more clear about his presence in the Eucharist than when he says, unless you eat my flesh, and drink my blood, you have no life and the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and lives because of me. And then that teaching is consistent all the way through the teaching of the church. Blessed Carlo Acutis was chosen as the patron of the revival's first year. I'm excited to see who you're going to choose for the second and the third. But tell us about the significance of this first choice. You know, Blessed Carlo has kind of taken the world by storm because he was a teenager and a, and a modern teenager who fell deeply in love with the Eucharist, so deeply in love that he created a website on Eucharistic miracles and spent many hours in adoration and then ended up even offering his own suffering and death for a renewal of the church and specifically a renewal of, you know, the love of the Eucharist. And so we actually have been graced by the Archbishop of Assisi, where Blessed Carlos is buried, to have a first-class relic of him, and it's a piece of his heart. A very, a very small piece of his heart, but you can see it. When I announced to the bishops last November that we were naming him as the patron of the first year, there was a, a, a round of applause from the bishops. You could just tell the excitement because we've all been taken by this young man who lives such a deeply profound life and especially dedicated to the Eucharist. And he was made extraordinary through that belief. That's what's so beautiful about him. We just yes. celebrated the International Eucharistic Congress in Budapest last year, and I'm bringing this up because there is a correlation here. That event lasted several days and brought faithful from around the world to celebrate the real presence of Christ. How is this revival different from that event? You know, so our revival is has both, I would say. It's a both and. We definitely are going to have a National Eucharistic Congress in the summer of uh, 2024, July 17 to 21, 2024, in Indianapolis. You all want to be there. It's going to be a transformational event for this generation of Catholics. The last time we did a, a Congress of this side was the International Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia in 1976. And so this is going to bring together 100,000 Catholics from around the country. It's going to be an experience of the Lord's presence that I hope sets a fire that continues for many years. And I hope we actually continue the practice of having National Eucharistic Congresses every four or five years going forward. But the, uh, the the difference is that our revival is really also trying to reach the grassroots, right? 
So the bishops wanted to have a real impact, and so they developed a three-year program that would help us to impact the church at every level. So this first year, the diocesan year, we're really focusing on diocesan leaders and those people who already love the Eucharist. We want to equip and inspire them to share the faith in the second year of the parishes and then invite everyone to come to Indianapolis. But the third year is going to be the missionary year where we equip and inspire people to share the beauty and truth of our teaching beyond the borders of the church and hopefully bring back some of those people who are uh, who disaffiliated for various reasons or who left the church and even those who've never known about Jesus. We want to invite them to experience the power of his love in the Eucharist. Bishop Cousins, I know you have a pastor's heart. You're a shepherd. Um, what is your personal prayer for this incredible moment? You know, my personal prayer is that the church herself would be renewed and strengthened through this revival. And I see it sort of like, um, you know, like, like a retreat for the Church of the United States. You know, whenever we as individuals are going through difficult times, that's the time we need to be most rooted in our faith and most strengthened in our faith. And the same is true of the Church of the United States. Recently, I read the encyclical of Pope Leo XIII at the beginning of the 20th century on the Eucharist. And he basically said, knowing what's coming, and he, he had a, a sense that 20th century was going to be difficult, and he was right. He said, the church needs to be strengthened in her Eucharistic devotion so that she's ready to stand through the trials that come. And I think the same thing is true here near the beginning of the 21st century. This is a time to strengthen us in our identity, who we are, and that's revealed to us by Jesus in the Eucharist. We are the body of Christ, and if we are strengthened in that, we'll be able to witness to the world. That's beautiful. Well, I will be joining you in prayer, and I know that our viewers will too. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you, Muncie. God bless you. God bless you, too. Still to come on EWTN News In-Depth, the proper way to prepare for Holy Communion. We speak with Father Josh Johnson, but first... The second level of preparation is the exterior preparation of the priest. Pulling back the curtain of the sacristy, the prayerful steps priests take before Mass, and the history of the mystery of our faith. The Eucharist foretold in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. Welcome back to our special episode of EWTN News In-Depth, focused on the Eucharist. The Eucharist was instituted by Jesus Christ during the Last Supper, but His sacrifice and the sacrament were long foreshadowed in the Old Testament. One of the first is found in chapter 14 of the book of Genesis, when Abram, later called Abraham, encounters the king and priest of Salem called Melchizedek. Melchizedek brings out bread and wine to Abram and blesses him. Melchizedek is later mentioned in the letter to the Hebrews that proclaims Jesus as a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the most profound foreshadowing of the priesthood of Christ. Another example is God's gift of manna to the Israelites in the desert after the Exodus. It's the food come down from heaven and the food of angels, as we read in the Psalms, daily bread. In the Gospel of John, Christ is presented as the new manna. During the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. And here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. The greatest foreshadowing of the Eucharist is the Passover, when God spared the firstborn of Israel because of the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled on their doorposts, a lamb without blemish. Jesus is that lamb, the lamb of God sacrificed for our sins during the crucifixion. Father Patrick Briscoe, editor-in-chief of the Catholic News and Spirituality website Alatea, and one of the official preachers of the National Eucharistic Revival, joins us now to share more on the biblical history of Holy Communion. Father Briscoe, it's so great to have you here. What an honor to be a preacher for the Eucharistic Revival. How many of your brother priests are there with you, and what will you do? Well, thank you so much, Ponzi. It's so wonderful to be here with you to talk about this amazing project. Uh, for me, it's a huge privilege to be involved in it. There are over 50 priests who have been selected by various means, uh, by prayer and discernment and the nomination of our superiors to participate in the revival in this way. And seeing that great group gives me great confidence in the project. It's truly an immensely exciting thing to be sharing in. It's incredible. And you're tasked with charismatic Eucharistic preaching. Big words. What does that mean? 
Charismatic Eucharistic preaching. They are big words. That's absolutely <laughs> right. The charisma is the heart of the gospel. It's taking things back to really the, the bottom line, the absolute deepest things that Christians believe in. Charismatic preaching is supposed to recall the work that Jesus did by saving us, by suffering and dying for us on the cross. And it's to unite the hearer to the heart of these sacred mysteries. So charismatic preaching, that's what it does. It's just the announcing of these fundamental truths of the faith, allowing us to know and to believe with increasing confidence in the work that God has done in our lives, uh, in, in the promise of our salvation. Now, we're not just doing charismatic preaching, though. We're doing charismatic Eucharistic preaching. So we're connecting this, these deepest truths, the mystery of our salvation, to the greatest gift that God has given us, which is his continued presence, right? The gospels say, I will be with you always, even until the end of days. I will be with you always, even until the end of time, right? So the Lord has promised in the Eucharist to be here with us, announcing this mystery of salvation. Now, you were selected for your particular devotion to the Eucharist. I saw a lot of OPs on the, that list, a lot of Order of Preachers, Dominican Brothers. Um, what is that devotion, and what is the connection between the Eucharistic prayer and mission and going out into the world? Absolutely. For me, there's a, there's a few things at play, right? One is St. Thomas Aquinas, the great light of the Dominican order. St. Thomas had a great devotion to the Eucharist, and his theological understanding of the mystery of transubstantiation helped enlighten the church through the Middle Ages and is relevant even to the present day. So for me, it's very exciting to talk about St. Thomas's teaching, how he understands transubstantiation, that the Eucharist truly is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. So for me, that's great. As a Dominican friar, that matters a lot, but also in a personal way. The Eucharist had a central role in my vocation uh, because it was really serving at mass and at Eucharistic adoration that I found my priestly vocation, the beginnings of my priestly vocation. So I have, th I have this personal testimony that I'm really excited to be offering. Personal and also bigger because of how it affects the broader church. We just gave a brief history of the Eucharist, but has there been any change to the Euch Eucharistic prayer or how we consecrate the host? This is a great question. No, because the Catholic Church has held the teaching of Jesus since the very beginning, right? In the Gospels, our Lord tells us, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body. It's right there in the biblical text. Take this, all of you, and drink of it. This is my blood. Again, right there in the biblical text, Jesus is telling us what the bread is himself. He's telling us what is in the chalice himself. And through the ages, we've always practiced this. The church has always held this. Now, we've had different ways of expressing it. We've gained insights and particular clarities. Our devotion has changed, right? Eucharistic adoration, for example, was a kind of innovation of the Middle Ages. But did that change the fundamental doctrine of what we believe about the Eucharist? No. So down through the modern age, through the Second Vatican Council, down till today, we hold exactly the same thing that the Lord taught us in the Gospels that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus himself. Let's talk about Eucharistic adoration then. Your preaching is supposed to discuss in some way the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Do we know when Eucharistic adoration began? We must believe Jesus is present in order to participate, right? There is more than just the physical host that is there. Absolutely, absolutely. So broadly speaking, we can say in the Middle Ages, uh, historically, uh, it's clear that Eucharistic adoration actually came out of the elevation. So priests were holding up the host, right? And they were they were holding it up for such a long time, holding it longer and longer up during the mass uh, so that people could venerate it. So then we had this idea, this connection between the elevation of the host and the continued elevation of the host with the development of the monstrance, that beautiful vessel that they're often very round, uh, and gold, they're often very, uh, very elaborate vessels, right? With the development of the monstrance, we had a kind of extended elevation so that at the, that moment where the host is lifted up, we can unite ourselves to the Blessed Sacrament. So that's kind of, kind of the origin of the devotion and a little bit of the connection there. Now, for us as Catholics, what this means is that we can have a continued moment of prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. And I think this is very, very important. It's one, it's one of the most important devotions we have to go and spend time with the Lord who is truly present. Uh, of course, if there's not Eucharistic adoration, uh, meeting Christ uh, who is present in a tabernacle, absolutely worthy, make a visit to a church. But what Eucharistic adoration does is it presents the host to us in a way that we can see the Lord, right? In a way that we can see the sacred species. And it puts Christ before our eyes 
uh, that we might contemplate him with greater ease. Well, I'm so glad to know that you're part of this incredible revival, and we all eagerly await how the preachers will set so many hearts on fire. I hope that you'll come to my parish. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Confession and prayer are not the only steps you should take to prepare for Holy Communion. We dive into other ways you can prepare to receive next. And still to come, we explore several Eucharistic miracles from around the world as physical evidence of our Savior's sacrifice. Confession is a vital sacrament to our faith, but many people find it hard to do. In fact, many people don't go to confession for years. A 2015 Pew Research poll found that only 43% of Catholics said they went to confession at least once a year. While confessing our sins might seem intimidating, many Catholics express a feeling of peace, joy, and freedom after receiving the sacrament. In the confessional, we receive Christ's mercy in a tangible way. We can draw close to Him once again and learn to forgive others as well as ourselves. There is going to be, just on a human level, a little bit of fear because you're admitting your guilt. But the mercy of God is so great and so infinite that you're going to leave there with that sin being forgiven. While confessing mortal sins is necessary before receiving Holy Communion, the faithful are encouraged to confess venial sins too. The sacrament of confession helps us properly prepare ourselves for the Eucharist and to live in a state of grace. For a step-by-step -step guide to confession, examinations of conscience, and more, check out the Confession Guide for Adults article in the National Catholic Register. Confession serves as a great way to prepare for receiving the Holy Eucharist. Priests also prepare before taking part in Jesus' sacrifice before every Mass. Let's take a look at the preparation that happens in the sacristy. Reverend William Foley at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament and Father Charles Gallagher at Immaculate Conception, both in Washington, D.C., are pastors of their parishes. And one of the first things I do is to make sure the chalice is ready. In their sacristies, they work to ready the sacred vessels. Usually, uh, a priest will obtain a, a chalice at his ordination. Uh, my family bought this for me from a chalice maker in Montreal, Canada. And um, I liked it when I saw it right away, so they, they paid for that for me, and I've had it for, for over 42 years. The chalice, which holds the precious blood, and the paten, which will hold the precious body of Christ, are made of precious metals. The reason why you know, the paten and the chalice are so beautiful because they really touch God, and we want to give the best we have to God. Sacred linens are also set up. So you want to see the corporal, which is from the Latin word for body, and it's spread out like this so that when you are in the, during the Mass, when the priest breaks the host, uh, that or nothing falls off of it. Another sacred linen called a purificator. So after the chalice is used, um, I consume the remaining precious blood and I rinse it with water, and then I use a purificator to, to wipe it and to dry it. Priests can be helped by sacristans, like Grace Pereira. I love my job. I am, as I said over and over, I'm fortunate and privileged. Sacristans, deacons, and seminarians can all help priests prepare for the Mass. I get to learn from the graces, from people who are graceful and and wise and learned and, you know, blessed. After all of the vessels and linens are set and ready, a priest then gets vested for the Mass. So before the priest starts getting vested for Mass, he says a special prayer and to wash his hands. This prayer in Latin says, Give, Lord, strength to my hands to wipe out all stain so that without pollution of mind or body, I may dare to serve you. The vestments are put on, layer by layer. The first is called an amice, which is this white cloth. This is really meant to be like a helmet of salvation. Over the amice, I put on the alb, and alb comes from the Latin word albus, which just means white. A cincture, or belt, goes on after the alb followed by the soul, which is a sign of office. For each layer, there's a special prayer. 
And finally, the chasuble, the outer vestment, I should say. Um, the whole point in all these is that the priest is covering up his humanity because it's our Lord Jesus who celebrates the Mass. So all of these different elements help the priest realize it's our Lord Jesus who is taking over. Yes, he uses my voice, my hands, my gestures, but it's really our Lord and his power that is able to change the bread into his body. The work of the priests and sacristans doesn't end there. The linens and the vessels then need to be washed. So, and when it's washed, it's washed in a very special way. Because it, may, it comes in contact with the precious host, the precious blood. It would soak for a few days in water, um, along with any other, the, the sacred um, linens, and then that water would not be poured um, into this, in, down the drain. It would be poured into a special sink that we call a sacrarium. A sacrarium is a special sink. So this particular sink, goes not into the sewer system, but into the dirt, into the ground, so that the precious body and blood of the Lord does not get mingled with sewage, and so it just goes into the ground. The ritual cleaning of the body and blood of Christ is meticulous and sacred. It's an effort of love. The Mass is actually not one of the most time-consuming things we do, but it is the most important thing we do. So that's why it's sort of shrouded with all these special rituals, prayers of preparation, um, to help the priest prepare and celebrate Mass very well. And that's the most important thing he can do for his people. Preparation to receive is on both sides of the altar. Father Josh Johnson, pastor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and vocation director for the Diocese of Baton Rouge, joins us to talk more about the spiritual preparation for the faithful in the pews receiving the Eucharist. Father Josh, thank you so much for being with us. Many people struggle to pray. They struggle to find silence. Mm -hmm. Do you have some guidance on how to focus during Mass and before walking up the communion line? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think a lot of this has to do with the preparation that we do before we even go to Mass, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how much time have we spent reading the Scriptures uh, before we go to our, our Sunday worship of God? Um, and so I just I encourage people um, to, to bring even a pen and paper if they have to when they go to Mass. So as the priest is preaching the homily, they're able to, to, to take notes, they're able to write down what he's saying is speaking to them. Um, and they're also able to write down what, what's uh, piercing their heart so they can relate it to God after Mass as well. Uh, so I think that uh, whenever we have that time of silence before Mass, if we get there early and stay after, uh, that can always help us to, to better engage in worship of God at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So really taking the time. And we know we're truly receiving the body and blood of Christ but we're consuming it in a physical and human way. And I'm gonna ask you this really uncomfortable question because it's Without. really weird for some new and old Catholics to talk about this. How exactly are we supposed to do that? What is your best description of what we're physically supposed to do when we eat his body and drink his blood? Do we just receive, it on our, receive the Eucharist on our tongue and let it sit there? Um, What's, what is it that we actually are supposed to do? Yes. Yeah, so after we receive communion, uh, whether we receive in the hand or in the tongue, uh, kneeling um, or by bowing down, um, yeah, you can you can chew right on the body of Christ um, as He's in your mouth. But I always encourage people after you receive communion, like that is where the two become one flesh. Like the mm -hmm. Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And so, like when you receive and you go back to your pew, like you don't have to sit. Uh, you can sit, kneel, stand. You can even lie prostrate. Like this is a time <laughs> of profound, no, really, because it's a time of intimacy with with God, that you and, and God have become one at this moment. And so I just encourage people to, to, to really engage in the way that's most conducive for you to abide in intimacy with Jesus, because it's the most intimate part of the Mass when the two have become one flesh. Whatever feels most intimate for you, most reverent for you, that's beautiful. Yeah. So yeah. we just discussed the importance of confession before we started uh, talking, talking to you, Father Josh, and you co-authored The Pocket Guide to the Sacrament of Reconciliation with Father Mike Schmitz. And it opens Indeed. with a beautiful and very surprising invitation. Welcome to the club of people who commit the same sins they just confessed last week. Why is it important to start the conversation about the Eucharist with an understanding of the Sacrament of Reconciliation? Yeah, that's such a great question. I think that we shouldn't be receiving the Eucharist unless we're going to confession, but sometimes um, we are scared to go to confession because 
They're like, well, I, I keep struggling with the same sins over and over again. And I just want people to know that you're not alone. I mean, so many of the greatest saints who have preceded us in our walk toward eternity also had vices that they struggle with, not just for six months or for five years, but sometimes even for a lifetime. And so I want to encourage people to keep going to God's merciful throne in the sacrament of reconciliation. St. Paul himself struggled. He writes in Romans, he says, I do what I don't want to do, and what I don't want to do, I do. And that might sound like you. You might be like, that's me. I keep doing things I don't want to do. So keep coming to confession. Keep letting go of your sins so that we can place ourselves in a disposition that is um, okay with receiving Christ. We cannot receive Christ Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament unless we let go of our sins because St. Paul says if we receive the body and the blood of our Lord unworthily, like we will get sick, we could die, and we're essentially putting judgment on ourselves. And so sometimes whenever we're physically sick, it's because we're receiving communion in a state of serious sin. And that's not comfortable to hear, but it's biblical. It's what the mm -hmm. Word of God says. And so we want people to, to be inspired, to, to go to God's merciful throne and recognize I'm not the only one who struggles with this sin, whether it's wrath or pride or lust or gluttony or sloth or greed, whatever our, our bad habit is, like we want to encourage you, you're not the only one. The greatest saints who preceded us they also struggled. St. Francis de Sales struggled with wrath. Teresa of Avila struggled with pride. Augustine struggled with lust. Like, so you are not alone. So join those saints who have preceded us. Go to God's merciful throne. Receive his love and mercy. And then receive him in the Blessed Sacrament, this great gift that he has for us. Our Lord has heard it all before, right? And what do you have to say about shame? Just our last question. Shame or fear around confession. What advice do you have to get over it? Yeah, well, it's not from the from the Lord. So whenever we perceive shame or fear, I just encourage people, pick up your Bible and start reading out loud. Quick story. I know we have a little bit of time. So there was a guy who was an alcoholic. He went to this monk. He was like, Father, I'm struggling with alcohol. I don't want to keep falling to my addiction. So the monk said, well, read the Bible out loud. And the guy said, but I don't understand scripture when I read scripture. Mm -hmm. And the monk said, it doesn't matter if you understand scripture or not, because when you proclaim the word of God out loud, the devil does. The devil hears what you're saying, mm -hmm. and he's, he flees at the word of God. So if you experience shame or discouragement or fear or accusation or condemnation, if you experience these, these lies from the enemy, then just pick up the Bible and read out loud for 30 minutes. And as you proclaim the word of God out loud, whether or not you understand what you're reading or not is unimportant because the devil does. Those evil spirits do and they will flee and that will give you the, the grace to be able to run to God's merciful throne and the sacrament of reconciliation to receive those graces and then to go before the throne of God and the altar and to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, which John 6 says when we receive Jesus Christ in the Eucharist in the Bible, it says um, that we receive eternal life. So That's if we want right. eternal life, we need the Eucharist, but we also need the confession before the Eucharist. And we always think of grace and forgiveness in human terms, thinking about them as just the same as our ability to love and forgive, our human ability. How is the mercy and the love of God different, Father Josh? It's, it's beyond, you know, God's thoughts and God's ways are beyond ours. God does not see us the way we see ourselves. He does not know us the way we know ourselves. He does not love us the way we love ourselves. And so God is beyond our greatest um, uh, imagination that we could ever have of him. And so I encourage people to look at the cross, Look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and that would tell us everything we need to know about our God. On the cross, he was rejected and abandoned and denied and abused and, and misunderstood and cursed and mocked and killed. And as he's dying, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When he resurrected from uh, the dead, the very first words he spoke to the apostles were, peace be with you. Mm. This God that we worship is so different than us. He does not see us the way we see ourselves. And so if we go to the cross, if we go to the scriptures, then the word of God and our time and adoration of God uh, before the crucifix, before the blessed sacrament will, will transform our mind. It will transform the way that we see God, the way that we know God, the way that we want to be with God. And so I just encourage people to not limit God to, to what we've experienced in our humanity with our brothers and sisters who are fallen, but to be immersed in the word of God, be immersed in the presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, and yes. it's a game changer. He changes everything. Yes, he does. And so we run to confession and we run to the Eucharist. Thank you so much, Father Josh. Thanks, Masi. The idea that true flesh and true blood in a fully integrated way is uh, showing up on these rare occasions around the world. A look at Eucharistic miracles and how they serve to bolster our belief and draw non-believers to Jesus Christ to understand his sacrifice. The source and summit of our faith, the Holy Eucharist. We get to experience this incredible mystery every time we go to Mass. But our human eyes only see bread and wine. 
We are blessed, however, with miracles of the Eucharist, documented throughout the ages, including in Lanciano, Italy, where the oldest and longest lasting Eucharistic miracle can still be seen today. It occurred when a priest in the 8th century, who doubted in the real presence, saw the bread turn to flesh and the wine turn to blood before his eyes during the consecration. The bread and blood are held in a special monstrance in Lanciano. Scientists have studied the specimens and have concluded that they have no answer as to how it occurred. More recently, on Christmas Day in 2013 in Legnica, Poland, a host was put into water after it fell on the floor so it could dissolve. Instead, it began to bleed. Tests on the host began in 2014. Two years later, the results were announced that the sample contained striated or muscular heart tissue of human origin. The bishop of the diocese approved the Eucharistic miracle and established a small shrine for the faithful to visit. And a Eucharistic miracle happened three times in Buenos Aires in 1992, 1994, and 1996. A host that fell on the floor was placed in a container of water to dissolve, but turned into a bloody substance. Auxiliary Bishop Jorge Bergoglio, who, was, who we know today as Pope Francis, had the specimen analyzed by scientists who said the material was heart muscle. In all of these cases and in many others, the host that was tested by scientists found that the blood is human, AB blood type. The flesh is human heart tissue from the left ventricle with evidence of trauma. A man who has made a career out of investigating these types of miracles is EWTN's miracle hunter, Michael O'Neill. He's the author of Science and the Miraculous, How the Church Investigates the Supernatural. It's sold on EWTN's religious catalog website listed on your screen. Michael took a few minutes to chat with me about the miracles of the Eucharist. Michael, thank you for talking with us about this fascinating subject. You're no stranger to Eucharistic miracles. You've written books on the topic and you have a show on the topic and you've been interviewed by religious and secular media alike. What drew you to this beautiful phenomenon? Well, I think what's so fascinating is you look at all the types of miracles uh, throughout history, and I, people have gone to my website, miraclehunter.com, they know that I've specialized in covering Marian apparitions. But in many miracles, there are some sort of complications, like you need to have the testimony of a reliable witness to know if a Marian apparition is true. When it comes to Eucharistic miracles, science can actually validate that something miraculous is in fact happening, and I think that's what's uh, got great potential for drawing people closer to Jesus and to the church through these Eucharistic miracles. Absolutely. Many have said that supernatural activity, satanic or demonic, is on the rise. Have you seen an uptick in miracles reported and investigations of possible miracles as a counter to that, or do they continue to be rare? Well, I think the 1980s and 1990s were the, the heyday of miracles, Marian apparitions and otherwise. But we are seeing a, a greater number of Eucharistic miracles uh, around the world, not just in Europe uh, in, in recent years and decades. So I think that uh, perhaps uh, miracles of different types are on the rise. And the miracle in Lanciano, Italy, is one that you featured extensively, not something recent, uh, but something a little more ancient. Tell us about this Basilian monk. So this is perhaps the, the first and maybe most famous of all Eucharistic miracles happening in Lanciano in Italy in about the year 750 AD. And so there's this Basilian monk who has great doubts about the real presence and perhaps he's praying for a sign. And when he uh, consecrates the host and elevates it, he sees uh, the transformation of true flesh and true blood being made manifest on that consecrated host. And it, of course, instantaneously restores his faith. And we don't all have the benefit of having a Eucharistic miracle happen in our very presence, but people can actually visit Lanciano. And I traveled there for a program, Explore, uh, with EWTN. And we, you can see the, uh, all the scientific studies that have been done on this. And they have found true flesh and true blood blood type AB, and it's absolutely amazing to see uh, some of the science that's been looked at on this over the years. All right, you talk about scientific verification. Let's break this down a little. What's the process to verify a miracle? Who makes the assertion to confirm it? Who makes the final call? Are Catholic scientists, Catholic specifically, always chosen for these investigations? Well, different miracles have different uh, types of investigation, but it's usually the local bishop who's in charge of uh, investigating claims in his diocese. So when you do have a case of a Eucharistic miracle, for example, it'll most likely be the local priest reserving the Eucharist in water, as is the traditional way of doing that. Then he'll contact the local bishop if 
uh, red, red has uh, showed on the Eucharist, and sometimes it's red blood mold, but they might send it to scientists. In the case of 1996 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the famous Eucharistic miracle that was sent by Jorge Bergoglio, the future Pope Francis, he sent that to uh, atheistic scientists in New York City, and they came around and, and revealed that this was uh, true flesh and true blood uh, manifesting on this Eucharistic specimen. So, you know, I think that uh, involving non-Catholic scientists where possible is always the preference, but there is uh, there's some uh, difference across the board. It really makes such a difference for you to mention that miracle because there is a lot there in terms of what we've seen over the years and the history of this supernatural manifestation of the power of God. There's, it's nothing rare to someone who has read the Old Testament and believes in everything that was happening then. Might we uncover more as the Eucharistic revival kicks off and more people start to have this real belief in the real presence? It's my belief that uh, people who get to know these Eucharistic miracles, and they can see them all documented on my website, miraclehunter.com, but uh, the idea that true flesh and true blood in a fully integrated way is uh, showing up on these rare occasions around the world, not just in Italy, but we see in Mexico, we see in India, we see all over Europe so many cases, perhaps as many as 100 throughout history. And uh, you see a great correspondence with them all having blood type AB, all being heart muscle. And I think this is absolutely amazing. And the Shroud of Turin has blood type AB as well. So there are some fascinating things that I hope pe draw people's interest and draw them closer to the Eucharist as a result. Absolutely. Those correlations are beautiful and important for those of us who need to see to believe and blessed are those who don't. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Monty. Precious metals used to hold the precious body of our Lord and Savior. A look at the incredible artwork of one man who's on a mission to share the body of Christ with the world. We close our special episode today with a look at some incredible artwork made specifically for the adoration of the Eucharist. Inspired by a meeting with St. Pope John Paul II, a Polish artisan began a project that is now spanning the globe. His interaction with then Pope John Paul II sparked a miracle and a decision to share his deep faith and replicate his beautiful artwork in Catholic churches on every continent. Reporter Anja Petrus of EWTN Poland shares this faith journey in depth. God is beautiful, and we want to adore God. Beauty leads to God, and we can only bring people to God when they feel that they are in front of His presence and His beauty. Mariusz Drapikowski is a Catholic artist from Poland with a vision to create 12 altars for perpetual adoration and place them in every continent around the world. 12 altars, each blessed by the Pope, representing the 12 stars in the crown of the Virgin Mary. The first such center was established in Jerusalem, the next one in Kazakhstan. Every altar is crafted especially for the place they will end up. They include elements of the local art. But what is common to them all is a monstrance relating to the image of Our Lady at the center. Then we also built in South Korea and the Philippines. Then we went to Africa, Cabejo, and Rwanda. And here in Nipokalanov, our friendships with EWTN became closer, which broadcast adoration of the Blessed Sacrament from Nipokalanov to the whole world. This altar in Nipokalanov has become the biggest online adoration in the world, counting an average of 300 people praying online at any time. We build beautiful architecture, beautiful churches, in order to make our prayer more profound, creating the atmosphere, so that we are more concentrated and more receptive and sincere.
St. John Paul, in his letter to artists, quoted Marc Chagall, who said that for centuries, artists have been dipping their brushes into the colorful alphabet of faith and beauty that is the gospel. And this, too, is the source of inspiration for me. Trapikowski has a special and very strong bond with St. John Paul II, whom he had met several times with his family. Their last meeting was on December 10, 2003 in Rome, and for him it was the most memorable. I became very ill at the age of 40, and the disease, which was supposed to be mild, took a very acute, violent course. When I walked in, I had to hold on to my wife's arm to keep from falling over and getting lost. In their conversation, Drapikowski promised to create an amber dress for the icon of Our Lady of Częstochowa at Jasna Góra. For someone who can hardly see anymore, such a commitment is irrational, impossible to make. It was influenced by emotion, by the moment, by the meeting with the Holy Father. It was said so spontaneously that the Holy Father smiled and put his hand on my head and blessed me. There wasn't any electric current that went through me, but after a week I regained my sight so I could fulfill my commitment. Drapikowski fulfilled his promise and created the amber dress for the icon of Our Lady of Częstochowa, in front of which Pope Benedict XVI prayed when visiting the shrine in 2006. Myers took this miraculous healing as a sign to continue his work with sacred art. So today, I do what I do because I was given help, not to waste it. I have to devote myself to creativity, to do what I do. Ania Pietrus from Wrocław, Poland for EWTN News in depth. Thank you for joining us for this special broadcast of EWTN News In-Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Join us next week for more news and stories important to your Catholic life.